Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome and hello to tonight's science and conservation event uh, brought to you by the Zoological Society of London and entitled Nature Recovery in British Wooded Landscape. Uh, my name is Natalie Petrelli. I'm a conservation biologist here at the Zoological Society of London, and uh, my work uh, has uh, all to do with nature recovery and uh, uh, dealing with climate change. So uh, today we've got three brilliant speakers to um, to discuss nature recovery in a British uh, wooded landscape, and that is uh, Henrika Schulter Tubuna from uh, ZSL, as well as uh, Hewen McHenry and Louise Wilkinson. But before um, I give a short introduction and uh, will then introduce the speakers, I thought um, um, I'd like to remind you about how uh, you can take part in uh, today's event. Um, because we really like to hear from you and we particularly welcome your question uh, to uh, our speakers. So uh, there are two ways you can um, do this and interact with us and ask questions. The first one is you can go to our pigeonhole uh, webpage at www.pigeonhole.at slash 1931. Um, and there you can type your question for our speakers. Uh, and if your question is for a particular speaker, then please do remember to state their, to state their name sorry, in your question so that we know who to ask it to. Um, if for any reason uh, you can't access that web page, then you can also email our team. Uh, and that's at scientific.events at zsl.org. So that's scientific events at zsl.org. Um, and then um, they will take on your question, share it uh, uh, with um, our speakers or put it on pigeonhole so that we can ask uh, your uh, question during the event. Um, I will be reminding you of those details later on, um, and they will also be in the YouTube description below. And at the end of the event, I'll be sharing a survey, a survey monkey, sorry, link with you because uh, we're really uh, trying to uh, know how um, you've enjoyed the event, and we want to hear from you as to what you think. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, let's uh, get back to tonight's event. So I've put a little presentation together, which uh, just need to do this, and hopefully it all work. Ta -da. Um, so today we're going to talk about nature recovery in British wooded uh, landscape. And so some of you might wonder, um, how ZSL and forest is connected, speci specifically because um, of uh, the society being a zoological society to start with. And it is true that uh, if we are looking at through uh, the past few decades as to how ZSL has been working or thinking about forest, um, has been primarily through the lens of thinking about uh, wildlife habitat, whether it's uh, for pangolin or for uh, Hainan, um Gibbons. Uh, we have also built quite a, a, a lot of work around a forest as a commodity, as a resource through our spot program, looking at illegal deforestation and uh, looking at palm oil uh, expansion. And then we have we have worked on forest uh, as a, and seen it as an ecosystem, but particularly in tropical uh, environment and particularly mangroves. But um, over the past few years, there's been quite a, um, um, an expansion of how ZSL think about forest. And uh, as an organization in general, we have much move much more as to uh, dealing and focusing on species and species conservation to really moving into a, an ecosystem and species approach, thinking about how species uh, composition and relationship underpins ecosystem functioning and also really looking at ecosystem dynamics and conservation. And some of this um, uh, change in how we think about this has uh, probably been motivated by the increasing importance of climate change, uh, how it affects biodiversity, but also how uh, biodiversity plays a key role for addressing the climate change crisis, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. 
So today we're talking about forest in the UK, and you might also wonder why the UK. Well, there's four good reasons to really talk forest in the UK and why it's topical and why it's it's a, an interesting example. First of all, um, there is a lot of different type of forested ecosystem uh, in the UK, uh, going from the rainforest, that's a temperate rainforest that many people do not know about, to a different type of, um, of uh, uh, forested ecosystem uh, going temperate uh, in different regions. And that's because the UK span uh, quite a lot of uh, um, um, uh, environmental condition. Um, it's also a densely populated country um, uh, that has um, lost quite a lot of wildlife. So bringing back biodiversity in a densely populated country is an interesting question from the point of view of uh, human wildlife conflict and uh, uh, nature recovery. Um, the interest in forest is particularly uh, uh, key uh, from a governmental perspective with a huge ambition for uh, reforestation and afforestation and declared in a number of uh, governmental uh, decisions. And then this is also a country that is experiencing a rapid change in climatic condition, which is reshaping um, ecosystem, uh, ecological communities and uh, ecological niche available uh, through the country. Um, now, what's interesting is that um, you will see that uh, the, the title of the event uh, mentioned nature recovery and wooded landscape. So the term nature recovery was really uh, chosen by the organizers and the speakers um, because they wanted to highlight that uh, their talk and uh, how they think about this relates to promoting ecosystem function and resilience. Uh, and for this, uh, to, for this recovery to boost biodiversity as well as nature benefits to people. And they wanted to acknowledge that nature recovery can uh, um, be delivered through different approaches, um, which might be protection, uh, restoration or uh, rewilding. Now, the focus on wooded landscape is also interesting because the, the idea here was to really highlight that this isn't just about planting a lot of tree and making a lot of wooded area, but uh, really thinking about uh, how a forested ecosystem interact with other ecosystem at the landscape scale and how uh, those forests and those woodlands are connected to and interact with um, the landscape. Therefore, really looking at the importance of uh, trees and their ecological role um, in all kinds of habitats, including open canopy one. So um, this is uh, me finishing my presentation. And uh, let's go to uh, the first uh, speakers. So the first speaker is Enrique Schulte Tubuna. Uh, uh, who works at the Institute of Geology uh, and the Institute of Zoology. So Henny is a, postural, a postdoctoral research uh, associate here and is interested in understanding how people um, change the makeup of rural landscapes, uh, for example, because of climate change. So to do this, she, to the, she uses a satellite remote sensing data uh, to investigate how vegetation changes at large uh, spatial scales over time. Uh, she has also done a lot of work on how fire and other disturbances affect the ecosystem and how different threats to biodiversity interact with each other. She's also interested in working out solutions to addressing this threat, for instance, through rewilding effort. Now, Henny will be presenting a talk entitled Current and Future Threat to Ancient Woodlands in the UK. Where are they and what can we do about them? And Henny, if you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Wow. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Can you guys see that? Um, fantastic. Yes, so my talk um, will be about current and future threats to a very specific type of um, woodland in the UK, ancient woodlands, um, and where those threats are and what we can do about them. Um, so, oh, let me just scroll. Yeah. So what are ancient woodlands, first of all? Um, they are obviously old woodlands, but they're not necessarily primary or the original woodlands. So if we think back to about roughly 10,000 years ago, it was the end of the last ice age and forests started to spread um, over the British Isles. And that's what's termed sort of the wildwood, the primary wood, the original uh, woodlands in the UK. Most of those have actually been cleared since the Neolithic um, 
going on through the Roman times, um, extensive clearances during the medieval times. So a lot of the really old woods that we see are actually regenerated from areas that had been at some point cleared. Um, but they are old enough, these ancient woodlands, to be ecologically distinct and to form their own separate category, separate from more recent woodlands. But what does that mean? So um, ancient woodlands, sorry, ancient woodlands are ecologically distinct because they contain species, and those are often species found in the understory, plant species, for instance, that are very bad at colonizing new uh, woodlands and that are that tend to be found only in areas where there has been woodlands for a long time. So if there's um, when a new woodland emerges, even though that might be 200 years old, often you don't find in those woodlands these um, ancient woodland specialists. Um, in ancient woodlands where that are in really good conditions in the UK, you also see uh, you know, you have native, um, often broadleaf species um, with a very mixed age structure. So you get lots of young trees, but you also get these really old veteran trees that um, are really valuable for biodiversity because they have lots of holes and lots of dead wood that are really valuable for insects and birds, for instance. And you also have lots of lying dead wood that are, again, fantastic for lots of beetles and fungi who thrive on decaying wood. Um, Let's move on. So where, um, where in the UK do we still have ancient woodlands? Um, in practice, what we use is old maps. So we go and find the oldest high quality maps that we have. We identify areas uh, that were woodlands then, and we check if they're woodlands now, and that's basically how it goes. Each country in the UK maintains its own database using their own maps. So depending on what country you're in, you might be able to trace ancient woodlands back to a uh, um, uh, different times. So in England, the cutoff tends to be 1600. Scotland and Wales, good maps are a little bit younger. So the cutoff is a little bit younger. Now, I actually don't really know um, when the cutoff for Northern Ireland is. So I apologize. Um, but overall, there's about 8,200 square kilometers of ancient woodland left. 40% of that roughly has been converted into plantations, though. Um, and overall, that uh, that is equivalent to about a quarter of all the woodland in the UK. Most of these are tiny though, and you will see from this map, it's really difficult to make out these individual ancient woodlands at the scale. But if we um, aggregate them, um, and I've just, this is the same map basically, but I've just aggregated them into 10 kilometer squares and I've just counted the area of all um, ancient woodlands in each square. And you can see there's these hotspots um, in Southeastern Wales, Southeastern uh, England, and also up uh, in Scotland as well. So that's what we have at the moment. So what are current threats to ancient woodlands? Um, lots of different threats, sadly. Um, a lot of that has to do with uh, declines in traditional management because ancient woodlands, were, most of them were working wood. So people use them um, for coppicing, as wood pasture, um, for charcoaling. And especially since the 20th century, um, that traditional management has declined and that leads to um, often leads to biodiversity loss. There's tree diseases. Uh, most of you will be familiar with ash dieback or perhaps oak declines that are threatening these woods. Then you have overgrazing from deer and sometimes gray squirrel. Um, and ancient woodlands are still occasionally cleared um, for infrastructure development, often housing um, rail, new railway lines, um, stuff like that. But what we're going to focus on today is um, something that ecologists call edge effects. And that is illustrated by this um, pretty random ancient woodland that I just picked out of the database. This is such as coppice. Uh, and it's very typical for the UK. It's very small and it's set in this matrix of agricultural land. So it's surrounded on almost all sides by intensively used um, land. And you can imagine there's there may be fertilizers that are applied to, uh, to this land um, herbicides might be applied, and you can imagine that that pollution kind of seeps into the ancient woodland. So what are edge effects? How do they work? Um, so when, because ancient woodlands are fragmented, so they're small and they're often isolated, they are vulnerable to impacts from the surrounding landscape. So if you imagine a big ancient forest, uh, and then you have a source of pollution um, nearby, that pollution will travel into the forest either by water or by air. And then gradually, as it moves through the forest, it will be filtered out 
And then if you're far inside the ancient woodland, you won't really see that pollution anymore. And that area is referred to as the woodland core that's unaffected by this pollution. And the part of the woodland that is affected by that pollution is called the woodland edge. So the impact of land use doesn't stop at the woodland border. It goes on to, um, to some extent. And when we reviewed the literature, we found evidence for a lot of those edge effects in British woodlands, not just ancient woodlands, but all woodlands. So um, there's pollution from agrochemicals such as fertilizers and herbicides, um, heavy metal pollution, for instance, from roads, and also um, where ancient woodlands are close to more open um, habitats. And that could be an, an acid grassland, that could be heathland, that could be another semi-natural land cover. Uh, the microclimate in those edges tends to be drier, warmer, and windier. So there's a bit more kind of environmental stress on the trees that are um, at the woodland edge. And the literature has, um, there are lots, of, all these edges kind of, the depth of the, those edges depend on what woodland you look at and what um, type of pollution or microclimatic effect you look at. But roughly speaking, a good rule of thumb is around 100 meters. So about for the first 100 meters, you can expect ancient woodlands to be affected by whatever surrounding them. So what we did was then to map for all the ancient woodlands that we knew about, those first 100 meters and look at how big that area was compared to the total ancient woodland area. Um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. So this is um, a map of each ancient woodland in the UK, um, and it shows the percentage of each ancient woodland that is, is set, that is covered by this edge uh, area. And you can see lots, uh, most of that map, in fact, is red, and it's really difficult to make out the more gray uh, ancient woodlands that correspond to ancient woodlands that actually are surrounded by um, other types of woodland. Um, but it is very difficult to see on this map. So I've just, again, aggregated this just so it's easier to see. And again, you see this, this pattern that where there are most wood, most ancient woodlands, there are um, most of the ancient woodlands are actually surrounded by intensive land use or more open habitats rather than other woodlands. And now we come to the future threat. And the big one there is climate change. Um, climate change is already impacting woodlands. So woodland managers are increasingly reporting that they see uh, more impacts of droughts in the woodlands that they're managing. Um, we also have seen earlier leaf in dates um, that are probably caused by warmer springs. And in the future, the Met Office says, basically, summers are going to get warmer and drier, and um, winters are going to get warmer and wetter. And then we're also going to see an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events such as droughts or heat waves and potentially even of storms. And those are two really different aspects from the point of view of a woodland. Um, those, that average climate, when that changes, so the average heat during the summer, the average amount of rainfall that falls in the growing season, that uh, determines how well trees grow, how they generate, and it also determines their relative competitive ability. So. Um, an area where one tree species thrives now might be much better suited to another tree species in, say, 50 years time, and then that species takes over. Um, but what the extreme events determine is kind of large scale mortality and morbidity events. So those um, events might be rare, but they can be devastating. So again, we mapped all of these aspects for the UK. So we took changes in suitability of average climate, changes in drought frequency that we're expecting, storm intensity, flood frequency, and fire risk. And we came up with a combined climate change risk indicator, um, which uh, it's, you can see on this map. And again, the numbers don't really matter. What matters is the sort of spatial pattern that you see the ancient woodlands that are going to be most affected by all of these aspects of climate change are located along the Welsh-English border in Northern Ireland and in Southeast England. Um, and again, I've just aggregated this because uh, it's easier to see. And so you can see this broad pattern. So uh, Northern Ireland, Southeast England, and then along the Welsh English border, whereas you know, West Nor Northern West Scotland, um, probably less affected by these particular aspects of climate change. So what happens then when these threats overlap? And you can see from these two maps, um, Southeast 
England is a fantastic example for that because um, it has lots of ancient woodlands. It has lots of ancient woodlands that are affected by intensive land use or more open um, habitats that surround them. And it's also expected to um, be really severely affected by climate change. And in a nutshell, that's not great, probably. Um, we're still learning a lot about how uh, these interactions work, but basically it is safe to say that there's a lot of examples where if an ancient woodland is already exposed to these edge effects, that could make the impact of climate change on those um, uh, ancient woodlands considerably worse. So um, an example here is um, an, uh, the microclimate in an ancient woodland edge is already warmer, drier, and windier, close to more open habitat. And that might make the impact of a more general drought more severe. Or you have an ancient woodland that's entirely surrounded by really flammable land cover like heathland or cropland. And that might be at much higher risk of fire during dry weather than an ancient woodland that's entirely surrounded by other woodland. And um, you may have a situation where you have widespread flooding and the um, trees at the edge of the ancient woodland, they kind of take um, the most of the impact of debris that is or pollutants, frankly, that is carried by the floods. And there's lots of examples like this, and we're still learning a lot about this, but it's it's worrying. So what can we do about this? Well, there's three different things that are all interlinked. So first of all, we need to reduce the impact of climate change. And the most straightforward thing to do would be to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's quite difficult to do on a local level. That's kind of national, international level policy. Um, whenever we are in a position where we can choose what trees to plant at an ancient woodland site. And that is that is not super rare because a lot of these plantations are now being converted back to more native um, tree species. We can try and choose species that will thrive in, in, um, in the weather that we're expecting to see in 50 to 100 years time. Although that can be difficult because then we get into a lot of um, issues with provenance, for instance. Um, we can make sure that we protect soils uh, that we keep them from compacting so that water can infiltrate properly. Um, and we can make fire management plans so that we minimize the risk of fire. And when fire happens, um, we deal with it quickly so that the impact is minimized. Then we need to reduce the impact of edge effects. And first and foremost, we need to stop clearing ancient woodland um, to create basically prevent the creation of uh, new edges. And that could happen through, for instance, statutory protection of ancient woodlands. There's no instrument that specifically covers ancient woodlands at the moment, but they could be covered by existing instruments. Uh, we could ensure that new sources of pollution, um, uh, like livestock farms, are built far away from ancient woodlands because we now have a good understanding of where they are in the landscape. And where ancient woodlands are suffering from the effects of um, pollution or microclimatic effects, we can think about um, planting shelter belts around them or maybe integrating them into reforestation projects where that's appropriate. And I think Owen is going to talk about that a little bit later on. But basically, all of that doesn't work um, if we don't have woodland managers that are properly resourced, that have enough money and enough time and enough access to knowledge to, uh, to implement all these cool ideas and to make sure that ancient woodlands can thrive in the future. Yeah, and that's me. And I would, would just like to thank the Woodland Trust who funded all of this work and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Henny. Um, before uh, I start with some of the questions, and we have already got uh, three, so get ready. <laughs> uh, I just want to um, uh, give a quick shout out again as to how uh, you can ask questions to our speakers. Um, so uh, as a reminder, um, if you want uh, to ask a question, you can do two different things. You can go to pigeonhole uh, at dot at slash 1931, where you can type your question and please do uh, state the name of the speakers uh, your question is for um, so that I don't get it wrong when I ask. Um, there also you can vote uh, for your favorite question. So if you see a question you really would like to know uh, the answer to, please go ahead, vote. And that uh, gives me a cue as to which one I should ask. 
ask first. Um, but if you can't access for any reason pigeonhole.at slash 1931, just uh, drop an email to our scientific event team at scientific.event at, at zsl.org. That's it for uh, me um, putting the plug in again. Um, and so I'll go straight into some of the questions, Henry. Um, so first question um, is, can you um, provide some information about the uh, legal or protection status of ancient woodlands compared to non-ancient woodlands and uh, whether there's a difference or not? Uh, the there is no difference basically the straightforward answer ancient woodlands aren't automatically treated different because somebody because they're included in these ancient woodlands um um not archives but but lists that are held by the governments of the different countries so they are uh, recognized by the governments but just because an ancient woodland is part of that doesn't mean that it automatically gets um particular statutory protection um, some ancient woodlands, and a lot of them are actually uh, covered by existing um, instruments like SACs and things like that, uh, but that's not systematically the case, and that's why you often get into issues with um, if you know infrastructure development happens close to an ancient woodland that just nobody has really looked after, and or, uh, nobody really knows that it's there, and um, yeah, then, it, then there is no statutory protection. Another question for you. Could a warmer, wetter climate be good for woodland generation and accelerate growth in new woodlands? Ooh. Um, warmer, wetter overall. I mean, there's lots of uh, tree species that thrive um, in that kind of weather. Um, but we, we kind of have to think about what tree species we currently have. And also, it's not just the tree species that currently are present in Britain obviously have different um, habitat requirements, but also the an oak tree that grew up in, um, say, um, Derbyshire will have a very different climatic tolerance to an, the same species, the same oak seedling that grew up in, um, in southern France, for instance, just because um, as during the developmental phase, it was um, exposed to different temperatures and different rainfall. So you can't, it's not system, you can't really say, oh, um, it's going to be uh, wetter and warmer and therefore that's fine because all of these other tree species are going to take over now because they also need to get to the place where they can now thrive and um, trees are not super mobile and then people are kind of uh, rightfully I think very hesitant to just go and you know plant trees from anywhere in Europe in ancient woodlands which are really you know vulnerable um, unique habitats yeah. I'm guessing also, um, I think one point that might be important to make is that warmer and wetter, that's always, when people talk about climate change, they tend to always think about average, but the real point of climate change is that it increased uh, viability. So on average, it might be wetter, but if all the water falls in winter and then in yeah. summer, it's relatively dry, there's a completely different impact on ecosystem and wildlife than uh, an average that has very little variation from one month to another. And the same with warmer, of course. So um, yeah. um, the, the, the impact of extreme natural events and of uh, viability um, is as important to understand the relationship between climate and wildlife than just focusing on the averages. Um, and then I have a last question. Uh, question for you I mean there's more but I uh, will come back to that because we have a panel <laughs> yeah, later yeah. on so uh, what was the definition of ancient and does it vary around the UK yes um there is there is an ecological definition which just means it's old enough to be ecologically different and that basically comes from um people being interested in all in woodlands that they knew were old um, starting in the 1970s and realizing that they had a really different understory species composition than uh, woodlands that they knew were more recent. So it's a bit of a circular thing, but it does work in the UK. Um, so, uh, and then in practice, each country has a different um, approach for how they map ancient woodlands because they have different maps available. So there is no definition of ancient woodlands that is valid for the whole of the UK. 
Thank you so much, Hani, for this presentation. So we'll come back uh, to more questions when we have our panel at the end of uh, this event. But now we're going to move to the next speaker, um, and that is uh, Dr. Erwin McHenry, uh, who will uh, talk about bigger, better, and more join-up, measuring progress towards better connected wooded landscape. Now, Erwin is an ecologist uh, working on the interface between applied research and management, uh, who is interested in squeezing useful insight for action and policy from complex data. Um, he enjoys telling engaging stories, we're good for a treat, <laughs> with data and evidence to inspire and guide effective conservation work. Uh, Ewan is a big advocate for adaptive management and structured decision making with a PhD from Aberdeen focusing on quantitative population ecology and adaptive management in conservation. Ewan joined the Woodland Trust in 2019, where his work focuses on providing guidance around landscape scale conservation for habitat and species, with a particular focus on ecological functional connectivity. He also does a lot of other statistics and analysis to guide decision, big and small. The, Ewan, I hope that was a good introduction and the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Hello everyone, it's great to be here, uh, albeit virtually. Yeah, my talk is going to be about targeting and measuring the uh, nature recovery of our wooded landscapes. Uh, I thought I'd just start off with a uh, picture of a wooded landscape. And, you know, wooded landscapes that were once extensive and highly interconnected, once dominated all, really, of Europe, certainly Western Europe, uh, and the species that adapted to live in them that we now think of as specialists of a very specific habitat type, once thrived across the continent. and. Nowadays, because those species are adapted to this highly interconnected, massively sprawling habitat, they're vulnerable to the effects of habitat loss and habitat fragmentation because they just didn't evolve in, the, in that context. Add to this climate change, as species need to move increasingly north in the Northern Hemisphere, they need that interconnectedness of extensive habitat in order to shift their ranges northwards and establish sequentially more and more populations as they head north. This picture is from Romania, where th this looks quite good there. Uh, what looks good here is kind of more like this. Um, the UK has experienced a large degree of habitat loss over the years. We rank pretty poorly compared to our European neighbors in terms of woodland cover. But half the woodland that we do have, which isn't very much, is non-native woodland. So only about half of that woodland is actually of the what we think of as the better quality for native wildlife, native woodland. Um, and only 7% of that native woodland is of good ecological quality. So in, in the forest research, the government research institution for forestries has gone through an extensive survey of woodlands across the UK. Only 7% of native woodlands are classed as ecologically favorable. That's 0.1%. 4% of all UK's land, something to think about. So if you're faced with this situation where we need to restore nature at a landscape scale, where do you start? What If you've only got 100 hectares of woodland to add to this, do you, do you focus on it in restoring woodland that already exists? Do you expand patches that already exist in the landscape? Which patches do you choose? Or do you try and use it to link up different patches in the landscape? And these are the kind of questions that I try to advise on in, in my day to day. And it's very complicated. You've got this incredibly complicated system. It's dynamic. You've got different land owners managing different parts of the land for different reasons. And you want to try and get everything working for wildlife and for people. I like to simplify things down with all this complexity. I like to view the world through this, this lens of a habitat network of patches and a matrix. Luckily, Henning's already talked us through a little bit of this before, but a patch is basically an area you can draw a line around and say that's habitat where wildlife species can reproduce and populations can grow. Uh, and then the matrix is everything else. You can't reproduce there if you're the kind of wildlife that we're interested in conserving, but you can move through it and you can exchange individuals between populations that might exist in different patches. And the, this network of interlinked patches can 
get quite stable. And if, if it's well interlinked, they can be resilient through time, even if locally on the scale of individual patches, populations are terribly turbulent. They can go extinct. They can be recolonized. This can actually be good for the, the wider functioning of ecosystems. But without that interconnectedness between patches, every single patch, all the wildlife populations in them would eventually go extinct. And it's that connectivity that allows extinct patches to be recolonized, allows declining populations to be rescued by immigration, allows species to shift their range and maintain genetically healthy populations. You see here is a little pet example of mine of water voles in the far northwest of Scotland. The top graph here shows the number of sites that are occupied. You can see a great deal of stability there, despite large numbers of extinctions and colonizations year to year. Some species are quite well adapted to fragmented population, fragmented landscapes, not so much the specials to the ancient woodland. Though. So how do we get there? How do we restore nature at landscape scale? Luckily, we kind of have a good idea of how to do this. We need to build bigger, better, and more joined habitat networks. And this is well, well embedded. We, we understand that that's essentially what we need to do. We need bigger and better habitat networks because bigger and better habitat has more resources in it for wildlife populations. More resources means more reproduction, less death, faster growing populations. They're less vulnerable to chance events, storms that might rip through. And ultimately, they have lower extinction rate. And they also produce more potential dispersers that go out into the landscape and potentially make those patches more joined. And those more joined patches have more successful dispersal between them. Not dispersal is what goes to colonize new habitat that may be created or become available due to climate change. And as I said, recolonize patches that go extinct and all this other stuff. I'm going to shift gear a little bit and talk about the Woodland Trust's work. We have these 10 priority landscapes in our work, and uh, we call them treescapes. It was original when we first decided to start using it, and now everyone's calling things treescapes. That's okay. Anyway, we have these 10 priority landscapes where we're aiming to do transformational change at landscape scales. They all have different priorities and themes and goals, but they all talk about creating these bigger, better, more joined wooded habitat networks that are resilient and have ecological connectivity. And this is, is this common now? This push is really where I try to focus a lot of my work and providing advice to get us to do it more effectively. I'll focus in on one of those, the Northern Forest. It's the biggest of the bunch. Uh, it's got an air, it's huge. It's 2.5 million hectares. It's got 7% woodland cover currently, which is about half of the UK average. And it's got a very small amount of ancient woodland, only 1%. But there's this aspiration through different partners coming together, government, uh, NGOs, various organizations have come together with this aspiration to plant 50 million trees the next 25 years, going to absolutely transform this landscape. And that's the target, plant 50 million trees. But that's not really a fantastic target when it comes to trying to get good conservation done. I'd, I'd, we like to see targets more like a resilient landscape, a resilient habitat network for thriving wildlife populations and for people to enjoy and to get a lot out of ultimately. So that's the thing that really I'm interested in measuring and interested in targeting our work towards creating rather than just the number of trees in the ground. So how do we measure that? How do we measure this idea of this bigger, better, more joined thing? Well, I think a lot about that. Uh, why do we want to do it? Well, we want to measure our progress so we know we're going in the right direction. We want to know what works and what doesn't work. And we want to be able to target and prioritize our action. We want to find out where the hot spots are in the landscape for the functioning of these habitat networks. We want to expand them and enhance them and link them together. We need to do this in a way that's relatively simple, but ecologically realistic and informative. And uh, we need to do it in a way that we can do it repeatedly over years uh, using data that we can collect fairly simply. Um, so let's do it. Let's, let's build a, a functional connectivity metric together. So we've got this landscape that contains habitat patches in which our species that we're interested in can reproduce. Uh, let's have butterflies, they're fun. Uh, and bigger, better patches produce more resources, more offspring, we know that. You might even say, okay, simply put, maybe the more, the more size and quality of a patch, the amount of offspring goes up. And we can maybe assume that it just keeps going up in the same direction. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a minimum amount 
of a habitat that we require to have a functioning population at all. And that's nice, because I want this to be simple. And now we've got a simple relationship, so I can just get rid of the butterflies. Um, and then we want to talk about them being more joined, so the connections between these patches. And they're connected by dispersal. And dispersal is this process where individuals shift between patches. It typically only happens once in an individual's life. Seeds, uh, flying butterflies, the juvenile of uh, Pine Martin, say. It's whenever they leave the place they were born, they travel through this dangerous place that they've never been before, this matrix full of threats and terrors. And they arrive in this new patch with enough left in the tank in order to settle down and contribute to that patch's future population. So when they tell us those four things, it hasn't dispersed. This isn't moving from where you eat to where you live. It isn't taking a bus every day. This is going to live in France without any prior knowledge of how to get there. Typically, the chance of dispersing decreases with increasing distance. That's a well-informed relationship. It's, it's simple enough to, we can think of an average distance that a, a beast or plant or whatever might disperse. And we can have a pretty good guess of what this shape looks like. Um, but there's more to it than just distance. There's this idea of, well, if you crossing a road is more dangerous than going through some scrubland. So there's different landscape features that might incur a different cost on dispersal. So instead of distance, we can think of the ecological distance or the ecological cost of getting from where you're born to where you end up. And there's some maths that you yeah, don't worry about. Um, so let's pull all these things together. We'll throw some more maths at it. It's relatively, I mean, as far as maths goes, it's relatively simple and elegant. I mean, I can understand it. Uh, and we've got ourselves a metric for functional connectivity. I don't wanna worry really too much about the numbers and how that all comes together. Really what I wanna say here is we've got a metric for measuring landscapes in terms of their, their functioning at big landscape scale. And we're using the same units for, we, because we've got a metric, we can use the same currency to measure the connectivity of a single patch. We can measure the input into an individual patch, or we can measure all the connections and how much they're worth across the entire landscape. So this allows us to ask ourselves a question of our really complex system. If there was a single hypothetical patch that had the same functioning, what area would that be? And this allows us to measure this really complicated thing in terms of area, which is cool because we can set targets. We can say we want to double this and people can understand what change means. So there we've done it. Let's, this is a toy example. Let's walk through a real wooded landscape. This is a five kilometer area of wooded landscape. I realize I'm running out of time already. Um, so we can measure the area of these woodlands. That's easy enough. Measuring the quality is a bit more difficult. We know where the ancient woodland is, thanks to the wood ancient woodland inventories that Henny has already described. And we also have an idea of where these deleterious edges, these places of the woodland maybe aren't quite so good. And we can bring those two things together to get an idea of the quality of different parts of these woodlands. So this is kind of how good are these different areas of woodland? We can then have an average quality for each woodland. And we can then say, okay, if, if we kind of multiply the quality and the area together to make it all the same, this is starting to look more like that simple toy model that we did at the start. So we've got the bigger and the better together now in this real landscape. We then want to think about the connectedness between them. How, what's the ecological cost of getting from this patch to these other patches? And we can measure that. And then, as I said before, we can compare, we can come to some kind of assessment of what the chances are of actually making it to that new place and starting a family there. And we can do that for all the patches coming in to a, a patch that we might be interested in. Here, the thickness of the lines, thicker lines are more likely to successfully disperse. And we can bring together the bigger, the better, the more joined up the input into one patch. Think about the connections between all the patches in the landscape, and then also think about the input of all the habitat that exists outside the area that we're interested in. Bring it all together, throw the equation at it, and we get this. This is the equivalent connected area, the, co the functional connectivity of this landscape using a currency that we can understand what it means. And we can map that across landscapes. This is it across the Northern Forest. We can pick out hotspots to guide our work, we can say, okay, we want to expand and enhance this hotspot. We want to link together 
these ones. We can look through time because this, the data used to make this is, is available since the 90s. 1990 to 2019, spot the difference. The Mersey Forest Project, big woodland creation, native woodland created on a huge scale, really shows up here. We can go through and see some different areas as well, or we could just look at the change. So here, the blue areas have decreased, the yellow areas have increased. Around the fringe of the Peak District National Park is a worrying area. That immediately springs out. But we see lots of good stories here as well. And on the whole, this area has actually increased in that time, which is great. And we can do this for all of these landscape focal areas that we're interested in. And this is now being translated down to people working on the ground, actually have to make decisions about where, who they're going to talk to about within creation, who they're going to talk to about restoration in different areas and informing action. And that's that's great. That's, that's what I live for. Um, so as a little aside to finish up, I'll just go through a little case study about how we're, we're currently using this work to prioritize our restoration in different landscapes. So this is a map of the um, conifer plantations on ancient woodland in different land holdings. So ancient woodland that has more conifer on it is probably is more threatened. So we can engage an individual landowner and get them on this journey towards restoration. We want to hit the redder landowners first because they have more threatened area. So that was, that was quite, quite a simple way of looking at it. But if we then overlay this connectivity metric, we can think about, okay, where can we do that Target the more threatened areas, but also target those areas that expand, enhance, and link together these hotspots in the landscape. So suddenly this comes out as very important. It's very high quality landscape. And there's also this big potential to improve it. Here, this could start linking together these two hotspots in the landscape. And this means ultimately taking resources away from places like this or, or here, where although threatened, potentially they're further down the list of priorities because they don't exist in these quite a bit more high quality areas that are, have more bang for buck. So that's me, uh, that's my email address and my Twitter. You'll be better off getting me by email if you want to chat. I love collaborating with people. So if you if anyone wants to uh, work on something like this, I'm, I'm all ears. I also want to plug the Woodland Trust State of the UK's Woods and Trees, which is a fantastic resource that contains, including case studies like this, a whole bunch of other ones that you might find interesting. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Ewan, for uh, this uh, super interesting presentation. Uh, as a quick plug-in, if you have a question for our speakers, go to Pigeon Hall or send us an email and we'll put it there. And don't forget to vote if ever you see something that you would like uh, to be answered. Uh, I'm going to go with one, two question, Ewan, and then uh, the, the others will go for the panel, if that's all right. Um, so I think the, the one that I'm most likely to go with is um, some clarification about the functional connectivity metrics. So someone is asking where, whether this uh, connectivity metric was uh, for one species, and how do you go about balancing trade-off between multiple woodland species with different dispersal uh, distances, patch, etc.? Yeah, yeah. So this this is created with like an it's the, the model, the, the toy that I've built here has some kind of species in mind with it. Um it's not a specific species. It, that species kind of represents the kind of species that we want to do this habitat creation for. So there are the kind of species that aren't fantastic dispersers that, that require good quality woodland, like that like those cores. Um but the model can be adapted for any kind of species. If you understand its dispersal abilities and its habitat requirements, you can draw circles around habitat patches and define it as you wish. But yeah, in this case, we've tried to define it relatively broadly to keep in mind the kind of, of uh, plants and animals that maybe disperse maybe a kilometer or two on average, um, and that like ancient woodland, maybe twice as much as non-ancient woodland. Those are the kind of species that we're thinking about whenever we've done this model. And a related question uh, from a, another a viewer. Um, when uh, the quality of patches is assessed, uh, is it based purely on broad brush data such as edge effect, or does it also incorporate any site level field knowledge? Yes. Yeah, so in an ideal world, we would have site level knowledge and everything. And we're getting towards that ideal world with with satellites being able to measure things on really high scale, we can potentially measure these things in the future. We aren't quite there yet, 
we don't have a way to measure site quality at every single site in the UK. The Forest Research have got a sampling program of, I think it's 15,000 different woodlands across the UK, which is a huge investment and loads of information is coming out of that. But even that's still not enough to measure every individual patch in the landscape. And it's that level of information that we need to be able to do these kind of metrics. Uh, and also this idea of being able to measure it again and again, year after year, the data we use has to be relatively easy to come by. Um, but we can definitely inform it and we will be with more of this site level information that comes in and try and make a better guess of the quality. Quality is the hardest thing to define, I think, uh, broad, broadly. Ewan, thank you so much for this presentation. And uh, we're going to come back to you later uh, when we go on the panel with more questions. Uh, people keep coming with those questions. Uh, I'm looking at all of this, and they are all uh, getting ready for uh, that panel. But uh, for now, we are going to move to our uh, next speakers. And that is Louise Wilkinson, also from the Woodland Trust, uh, with a um, presentation entitled Policy Recommendation for putting trees and woods at the heart of nature recovery. Now, Louise is uh, the lead policy advocate for nature recovery at the Woodland Trust, working on protecting, restoring, and creating native wooded habitats to address the nature emergency across the four country of the UK. Prior to that, she worked at Yorkshire Wildlife Trust in a range of roles, including head of conservation and conservation policy and campaign manager. She has also held roles as a policy team leader at DEFRA, advising ministers on protected site and uplands as a, and as a consultant ecologist. Um, so Louise, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Hi, evening everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so the aim of what I'm gonna talk about today is really to share the thinking on what we need to do in the policy and legislation state space for nature recovery. So I'll start briefly by summarising what we think the main principles for nature recovery should be at landscape, wood and tree scales. And that will sort of underpin the um, that kind of gives us an, an idea of what success should look like. And that gives us the principles that underpin our policy advocacy. So. Um, I will then set out um, what we think needs to happen across all the different policy areas that we work in, forestry policy, agricultural policy, town country planning and all the interventions that um, across things like uh, policy levers, investment and then just sometimes generally just pressing forward with delivery plans for existing policies. So I'll just start with a quick slide. This is a very simplified version compared to what Henny and Ewan have presented um, on nature recovery for woods and trees. So it draws on the Lawton principles that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, so we want more semi-natural and natural wooded habitats and more trees in the landscape. We want bigger core areas um, increased primarily by buffering existing woods and trees and we want the sites to be better. So we want them to be more complex with more niches for species. And we want them to be dynamic ecosystems interacting with other habitats in the landscape. Um, so really playing their part as mosaics of habitats um, with um, grasslands and heathlands. And we want them to be free from threats. Some of the things that Henny talked about earlier and we want them to be joined up, um, joined up core habitats with nature friendly sort of areas between them. So nature friendly can be things like um, agroforestry, trees on farms and in urban areas. So just to start off with the principles for landscape scale um, recovery, um, just in summary, um, we want to protect and restore the um, existing resource. This isn't just about protecting it, but it's about having those foundational habitats where species can colonise the rest of the landscape from. We want bigger habitats. We want to prioritise native trees and shrubs because these are the ones that species are most adapted to and um, they're adapted to the local environment. 
we want to look towards um, natural regeneration, but where planting is needed then to make sure we use UK ISG assured trees. We want to look to reduce the threats to biodiversity. Um, again, Henny and Ewan have touched on these, things like overgrazing by deer, invasive species like rhododendron and um, tree diseases. Um, we want to make sure that we restore natural processes and dynamism. Um, this isn't always possible because a lot of um, England's woods are very small, so they need a more proactive type of management. And we want to um, really optimise the role of woods and trees in their role in the wider landscape for connectivity and as part of wider habitat mosaics. Um, and those bits of shrub, that sort of shrubby bit between woodlands and grasslands called ecotones tend to be the most important for wildlife. So we want to make those kind of as broad as possible. Um, and we would support the reintroduction of keystone species, but only where the conditions are right for their long term survival. So on a woodland scale, again, protect the surviving resource. Um, look towards improving the ecological condition by um, increasing diversity and enhancing structural complexity. So that's both horizontally looking at the kind of mosaic of habitats, uh, sort of with glades um, and edges, but also the vertical piece in a woodland of looking at different tree ages and looking to, on the ground for dead trees and leaving the fallen wood. Again, using active conservation management where it's appropriate and restoring natural processes. And again, lastly, at a tree scale, um, the principles are that ancient and veteran trees should be valued and protected. They should be a suitable buffer from damaging activity, particularly sort of trees on farms. Um, and also development threats, which Henny covered as well. Um, and then it's really important to identify future veteran trees um, to make sure that we're looking after the ones that become the veterans of the future. And again, this is kind of the case for all ecology, but particularly for woodlands and trees. We really need to think in tree time that a lot of these things take time. Um, and that does present a challenge when talking to policymakers, particularly politicians who often don't think beyond the next election. So we need to be thinking about how we make our points as compelling as possible to that audience. So picking back up the policy point, um, I think what we've kind of worked out tonight is nature recovery is pretty complex. So in order to make changes and to drive forward nature recovery in the policy arena. Um, there are many policy areas that we need to influence, including agriculture, forestry, land use planning, but also kind of the investment side of things as well. Um, and that can be um, legislation or policy. Or, or kind of just driving investment in existing policy commitments. So just thinking about what we already have, it's actually we've actually have got quite a lot of legal and policy commitments towards um, to take us forward to nature recovery. Um, you know, the government is, is, is quite good at, at kind of the words, <laughs> but the words alone, I think, is where we're at saying that the words alone aren't going to deliver nature recovery. So I'll just run through what we've got kind of a lot of it comes from the Environment Act um, and then I'll just talk about where the gaps are to kind of make it deliver real change on the ground. So the Environment Act brought in this new really really exciting legally binding target to halt the decline of species by 2030 and increase the abundance of wildlife by 10% by 2042. And then this other super duper exciting legal target to create um, 500,000 hectares of wildlife rich habitat. And excitingly, they've said wooded habitat should make 100,000 of that 500,000 target. So these are really, really welcome and really exciting. But what we do lack is a clear delivery plan, clear investment plan as to how that might 
happen and um, how the other government departments as well as CEFRA might help to deliver that. We've got the tree cover target um, by 2050. And I think the challenge for us here is to make sure that these are the right trees in the right places contributing to nature recovery across the landscape. The government commitment to protect 30% of land for nature by 2030 is also really exciting. But I think the key point that we want to be pressing for here is that lines on maps don't deliver nature recovery on their own. It's really about driving forward the management um, of the protected areas that really makes the difference for nature recovery. Um, the Keepers of Time policy commitment is another really exciting one, which was updated really recently, um, which talks about restoring um, ancient woodland. Um, it commits the government to bring the majority of native woodland back into restoration by 2030. But again, it lacks a real plan. So that's something we really need to be pressing DEFRA and we are pressing DEFRA on to give us that certainty and also the investment um, associated with it. The other really exciting thing is the local nature recovery strategies. They're an England wide system of spatial strategies which will identify uh, communities will come together and identify the priorities for nature recovery and map that at a local level. And that's all gonna be rolled out in the next month or, to, or two. So there's gonna be quite a lot of activity in that space. Um, and again, our concern there is around um, needing the teeth that local planning policy gives it and also the investment. We'd like it to be connected well to the emerging environmental land management schemes because that's where Treasury's biggest budget is for nature recovery. So it really needs to link up with that. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about the, um, a little bit more deeply about some specific recommendations that we need for nature recovery. Um, firstly, protecting more ancient woodland as a site of special scientific interest. Currently, only 16% of ancient woodland is designated as SSSI, which is actually pretty low when you look at the representative uh, proportion from some of the other habitat types. Um, and given that ancient woodland is an irreplaceable habitat, um, you know, we think there's some significant potential here for this. Just picking up the point about making sure that they're, um, that, that protection leads also to better management is that we know that only 38% of terrestrial protected sites in England are in good condition. So we really think that the new environmental land management schemes should be um, working harder to um, allocate funding for the landowners of protected sites to start to bring those into positive management. Secondly, we want to introduce legal protections for our ancient and important trees. We know that at least three quarters of them aren't protected. They're outside of protected sites. And um, actually still many of those are lost to development each year. Thirdly, we think it's really important that we can designate um, nature recovery areas. These are the sites that are, we hope will be, will be identified through the local nature recovery strategies as areas with potential for um, restoration, um, but they need to be protected in that period when they haven't quite got their quality, but they're on their journey um, towards becoming really important for nature recovery. So just looking towards our aspiration to create more wildlife um, rich um, landscapes with woods and trees, um, we have this target that I touched on just a few slides back to increase um, tree cover across England. Um, and we just think it's really important that we create quality. It's about quality, not just quantity. Um, so we want to ensure that these trees are really delivering for nature recovery and not just the climate um, agenda. We think that they can do both. Um, so we want the government to have a native tree canopy cover of 16% of because those, and we want them to be monitoring that for not just um, trees in the ground, but the um, priority species that it is then supporting. And finally, we want more um, 
creation of more woodlands in places where um, we know that uh, they're lacking. Um, the Environment Improvement Plan actually commits to um, semi-natural habitat within 15 minute walk of where people live. And we think this is really important um, because we all, you know, we're familiar with the um, mental and physical health benefits of that. And we know that the number of people who aren't able to access that is particularly impacted in the most disadvantaged areas. So we would like to apply the principles of tree equity to make sure that those people are the people that benefit most from the new tree planting. So in terms of restore, we know that this is a really important element that's been previously overlooked. Um, we know that most of England's woods aren't delivering for wildlife. As Ewan said, just 7% uh, of the UK's are in good condition, um, which means they're not um, supporting the abundance of species and diversity of species that they could. Um, so we think that there really does need to be new funding to tackle threats across the landscapes. Um, we know this will be costly, but I think seeing the species decline, um, we know that one third of all woodla woodland species are in decline. So it's a really important thing to get right. Um, again, picking up the keepers of time policy, which aims to get the majority of planted ancient woodland sites um, improved or under restoration really important to press government to accelerate progress on this um, because um, you know the severity of the nature crisis is, is fairly significant um, but it isn't just national government that have got a role local government have got a role too um, particularly with these local nature recovery strategies so we you know we'll be pressing for local authorities in the same way that they've called called for climate emergency to be calling for nature to be declaring sorry not calling for <laughs> declaring a climate emergency to be declaring a nature emergency um and set out how they're going to address that we think they the power lies with them to really implement this policy of 15 minutes um to semi-natural habitat um, we really want them to be embedded into local plan policy to make sure they're well funded and well coordinated with the um, environmental land management schemes. So that's me, really. I think in summary, we, we kind of know that nature recovery is really complicated um, to get right, but really vitally important. We've, we've got a lot of the policy and legislative tools. We, we really need to now be pressing for um, a commitment to deliver and to fund the, that action to really start making um, change on the ground and really impacting the wildlife there. So that's me, that's my um, email. If anyone does have any questions or things that they want to discuss after this event, please feel free to email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise, uh, for this uh, final presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, things to think about. Um, um, before we go on to the panel, um, um, I'd just like to ask you one or two questions, which I think uh, would be interesting for uh, for everyone. And uh, yes, I would need also to remind everyone to go on Pigeonhole um, and, uh, to ask your question to our panel or vote. And if you can't do it, uh, drop an email to scientificevent at zsl.org um, because we're waiting for your question and we are about to start our panel. But uh, Louise, um, before that, um, so two questions really quickly. The first one from our audience asking about uh, the Woodland Trust and rewilding. So is the Woodland Trust uh, involved with rewilding uh, project in the UK? Uh, I'm sorry, Natalie, I am going to have to start that with this. You and might know I've only been at the Wildlife Trust at uh, the Woodland Trust, excuse me, for you see, I've given myself away. There. I've only been at the at the Woodland Trust for eight months. So I, I, I'm going to have to pass that. Thank you, you and I can see that you've come on that you he, you and will be much better place to answer this. Than oh, me. I'm sorry, Louise, um, but the two of you, I think people just want to know how how the Woodland Trust is involved or um, deals with rewilding. I, I think that the word rewilding can be quite provocative and mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, we like to talk about working with natural processes. 
and to restore woodlands to the point at which natural processes can be an important part of their management. Okay, so basically a, a more um, um, in the broader sense of uh, the understanding of uh, uh, restoration with uh, both passive and potentially active and a, a wide array of management. Um, the other one that uh, I'm hoping Louise is more adaptive, <laughs> and that's from me. So um, uh, in your presentation, we can really see the amount of legislation that is that's being thrown uh, in terms of uh, addressing the environmental crisis. Um, and this doesn't even talk about the wall hype around uh, the net biodiversity gain and all the, the new uh, legislation that will come uh, uh, at the door of uh, local authorities having to regulate those new uh, um, uh, to, uh, having to implement those new ideas. And so from your perspective, when you have so much, so much different text, so, much, so many different ambitions, it might be difficult for anyone in a position of power to actually make a decision as to what to do, which I'm guessing why you went with some of the, of the recommendation. But um, said differently, of all those recommendations, which one are the one that you really hope will, will get um, some traction uh, with the government, or which one are particularly important uh, for people to, to listen and, and do something about? Um, yeah, so I, th I think, you know, different, the, the different, some of the different recommendations will resonate with diff some of the um, different audiences. Um, like you say, for the local authorities, it's really trying to help them to understand what late, uh, local nature recovery strategies can achieve. Um, and like you say, a lot of that will be delivered via biodiversity net gain. Um, so, in, in terms of kind of the local nature recovery piece, we're really positioning to help them to navigate actually what is quite a complex process for them. Um, in terms of national government, as you say, we've got, you know, lots of colleagues working on various elements with lots of different teams. Um, but I think one of the things that's really important that we probably haven't fully recognized the importance of yet um, is the importance of restoration. You know, we know that, um, you know, we've got this fairly horrifying statistic of 7% of the UK's um, woods and trees not being in good ecological condition, um, which means really that our woods aren't delivering what they could be delivering for wildlife. Um, and I think it's easy to sort of always be looking to the creation piece, whereas, actually you know so i think i think investing in tackling some of the threats that are affecting our wildlife things like um you know rhododendrons and tree diseases is really important as well as investing in the restoration of ancient woodlands so i think that that feels to me like the piece that has perhaps been a bit neglected and not that well understood um up until now so it yeah if there's one thing i think that would be really good to kind of be um, pressing forward on. It's that. Super. Um, what I'll do then is that I'm going to bring everybody back into a panel mode uh, as we've got um, 15 minutes or so to um, to uh, discuss uh, together some of the big questions that uh, have been posed. Thank you, Erwin and uh, Henny. Um, so the first question that is for the panel, and that can be quite interesting uh, to hear what you think about, is that um, one of uh, the viewers said that many species prefer open woodland and woodland edge is there a risk these species are being overlooked uh, to reach conservation uh, objective and how can we tackle this? Anyone that has uh, um, some comments on this? Yeah, Iwan? Yeah, uh, I, absolutely. I think, I mean, the, the edge of those transitionary zones, as, as Louise mentioned in her presentation, are vitally important. It's where an awful lot of the ecological variation that gives different species the room to thrive exists. Um, in the in the in the work that I presented, the edge that I was talking about there wasn't. It was about it was really a focus on the detrimental impacts that intensive land use can have, and that and the, the seepage of that into woodlands. I wasn't really thinking about I, the way I would define a woodland patch would very much contain the kinds of habitat that that viewer is talking about. Those transitionary zones 
I would view within the kind of framework that I was talking about as probably quite high quality woodland. So specifically for ancient woodlands, actually these open areas and glades and um, all of those more open habitats, they're really important when thinking about restoring ancient woodlands because they have been uh, they have been worked so heavily. So there's a lot of species that really don't do very well when the woods get too thick. So it's always going to be a balance. It's, it basically comes down to the, and that's where kind of I think the expertise and the experience of the individual woodland manager or, or owner comes in. Um, there has to be a decision about is this, you know, does this edge thrive? Like, does it support a wide range of species? Does this look healthy? Or is this, could this be supported in, um, in, supporting a wider range of species um, is, you know, is the edge, um, the edge that we want to see basically. So, but that is very difficult to do on like a landscape uh, level scale. And that's, I think also where the expertise of the individual um, managers comes in. Um, so another question, um, which I think could be uh, equally asked to all of you um, is that, um, do you think uh, the, uh, uh, the current drive to plant more the, to plant more trees sorry should be directed towards planting buffer zones uh, around ancient woods but the problem being that their border are often regarded as importing important historic landscape features anyone a comment on this Ooh, huge silence <laughs> I can have a go um so the Woodland Trust recently published a woodland creation guide which lays out our approach to woodland creation and part of that is about thinking about um, where to plant the wood and, and buffering existing woodlands is part of that uh, but also is the, by the first step towards woodland creation is a, a site assessment and that includes uh, an investigation of the archaeological interest on the site and carrying out woodland creation in a way that is sympathetic towards that. Uh, I think as well, when we're talking about creating woodland that buffers ancient woodland, it's a really good opportunity to start thinking about natural processes, like natural colonization of trees, um, as, as, as a much cheaper and possibly much more effective way to go about creating high quality, ecologically healthy woods. Um, another question maybe for the three of you, um, and this, this one's for me, is that, so what's interesting is that we started by a strong presentation on ancient footprints, then we went into bigger, better, joint connected, and then into a, a set of pro policy priorities. But as we all know, uh, there's not that much money going around, <laughs> and uh, potentially less so in the coming months. Um, so how do we prioritize within the priority as of um um should we go bigger should we go better should we go more ancient should we do how do we design a strategy that also take into account all those multiple priority but is mindful of one the fact that uh, money is running low in conservation and of two potentially that um there is untapped uh potential into not systematically thinking that government can do everything but trying to get into a modular approach and tailoring uh um ask to different audiences how how do you see this being uh how do you see that narrative evolve uh for uh, for action in a way i can i can i can have a go at this one <laughs> um yeah, I think I think one of the things that is really important is making the best use of the existing money that is available. So government has currently got around 2.4 billion focused on the delivering the emerging environmental land management scheme. So that's a, a, a three tier system. So the sustainable farming incentive to deliver, you know, fairly simple environmental actions to what was called the local nature recovery element, um, which is kind of the middle ground, which has now been replaced with countryside stewardship, and then the top tier, which is landscape recovery. Um, but the, there is a significant investment in delivering those. And actually, farmers have got a huge, there's huge potential, I think, in our farmed landscape um, to deliver some, um, you know, pretty exciting um, woodland creation and um, 
woodland management alongside of um, sustainable food production. Um, so I think in terms of that, it's really making sure that we are advocating into those spaces where there is, um, you know, potential for creation to make the best use of that sort of money. So that's that's um, and then, you know, there are other examples of that, for example, the budget that's attached to, um, you know, woodland creation and the tree planting targets, again, making sure that those trees aren't just, you know, the wrong, you know, we've all seen examples of where the wrong trees are in the wrong place and making sure that those trees aren't just delivering for other, you know, objectives, which are really important. You know, the climate change objective is really important, but I think it's really important that we optimise any um, tree planting um, and any budget that's attached to that to make sure that it it's delivering for biodiversity and nature recovery as well as that. So I think there's quite a lot that we can do there to sort of help government to focus its investment into the right places in the landscape. And I think we we kind of know where we want that to be and what we want that to, to do. So I think that, you know, that's a really powerful um, part of the equation. I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question. Was that about local localism? Was was that was there two questions in that? No, no, it was more about thinking as to how to, um, government is not the only entity that uh, that can actually deliver. Um, so that was that was, that was my second thing that was in my head. Sorry. Um, yeah, just to make the point, I know that um, government is um, very much looking to the kind of blended finance piece. So incentivizing private investment um, and um, looking at, how, at the role that um you know the corporate sector can play um and you know as the woodland trust we are also you know lo looking into that and i think it's really important to um not ignore that piece but um to make sure that they're really um you know that it really is delivering for nature recovery and it's not just sort of um you know an exercise um in sort of and there are some emerging things in that space that we're looking at. But I, I do think it's important that those don't replace government funding. I think there is a role for government funding within that as well as the private sector. And only because someone, one of our viewers probably think that at least one of you, probably you, Louise, is in the nose. But do you think there will be any good news for the environment in tomorrow's budget? Sadly, I'm not in the know. Well, let, let's oh. hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, I've heard noises, but I, yeah, I, I, not enough confidence to, um, to share them, and you know, um, but yeah, let's hope so. I, you know, I think we, we all need some good news in in a general way, don't we? But we all need some really good news for um, biodiversity and nature recovery. And then uh, another question, which uh, was originally uh, after uh, Henny's talk, um, where you were talking about the fact that woodland managers really need to be informed about ecology and ecological aspect uh, in the in the sense of managing uh, ancient woodland and the threat and uh, the ecology of that behind that. Uh, what uh, do you think uh, are the practical steps that um, NGO and uh, learned societies can take to achieve this? And uh, that is open to all of you because you might have different answer to this. But Henny first. Yeah, um, I think so from what I understand, um, there is actually still an information gap that woodland managers talk about. Um, a lot of them um, don't know because these are not, you know, a lot of people who own woodland, that's not their day job. They own a farm or they have a little piece of woodland and they actually have many other things to do. Um, and managing woodlands is very complicated. And the there is obviously a lot of information and data out there, but often that is not really accessible. So one of the ways that um, in, uh, organizations like ours can help is making that data more widely available and making it accessible as well, not just kind of uh, dropping lots of Excel sheets on people, but kind of talking them through it. Um, I'm, I've am i published um, some of my data and once uh, this, once we've written this, um, this work up and it's been through peer review, uh, that will be um, circulated more widely and I hope that's going to be useful for people, but that's one, um, setting up professional networks helping people through extension services um, so that people have, you know, a person that they can go to when they have questions like, you know, what tree species would be appropriate for my area? Where can, where can I find information about this? Um, things like that. 
Yeah. Any other comments on this, Ewan? Yeah, I think Henny, you kind of covered most of it. Um, there's a lot of goodwill out there to particularly get woods that are potentially in improper management into good management, but it's it's difficult. People don't know how to do it, it and uh, NGOs and government resourcing advisors to help people through that journey is a is a really important that really important thing to do, uh, and that's that's a place that learning societies, government organizations such as the Wooden Trust all have a really important role to play, but also peer-to-peer -peer communications as well and, and knowledge transfer and learning just between individuals, all really important. And another question, um, which I, I feel uh, uh, very important um, uh, from my perspective, is that um, it's um, a, a viewer says it's essential that three species are planted with future climate uh, in mind, uh, something that is really becoming pressing. Um, does this panel feel that this is addressed in policy? And if not, what are the knowledge gaps that uh, need to be filled or how to improve the policy? Any views on that? Really, it's a really tricky, really thorny issue for, for an island, okay, very large island. Um, but as as functional areas of species and biological communities shift northwards, that does require some consideration. And another important thing to consider is that as we, if we intentionally move individuals from a population of species from one place to another, we push that population through a bottleneck. And currently we're in a situation where the trees that have grown and adapted here over millennia have quite a large amount of genetic diversity and adaptedness to the conditions that they're in. There's also a risk of, along with importing plant matter, seeds and saplings, that we also then end up importing an awful lot of pests and diseases along with them. And there's fairly strong correlative evidence to suggest that the more, the more trees and plants that we import, more and more uh, diseases like ash dieback have arrived along with them that have been devastating for, for our native ecosystems. And, yeah, so a careful approach is very much needed. I don't have an answer for it. Right? Any comments on the, the knowledge gaps? Maybe, Henny, because uh, I know you went through some of these uh, knowledge, existing knowledge on uh, what we know about ecological niche and uh, native species in the UK. Um, I think one of the issues is that um, we have a lot of knowledge of, of what tree species could potentially thrive in different kinds of future climate, but that's often to maximize timber production. So we know what species kind of grow very well and work very fast, and then we can harvest them. Less clear, um, you know, how will they fare? You know, are they um, are they happy to regenerate after a large drought? Um, how well you know, how well do they do with um, the odd floods? How can they cope with um, landscape variability? And if it's a, a species that is currently not native or is maybe a slightly different provenance, um, are they being used by um, native species in the UK in the same or similar way than, um, than currently present species are? So actually a lot of, a lot of um, knowledge gap there still. And I hope, um, I hope that um, research is obviously an important part of that but also um, cooperating across borders and making sure that we cooperate with the, with, uh, the UK's neighbors to have like really strong biosecurity protocols in place so that people, if they decide, oh, actually it would be a really good idea if we got some oaks from France or wherever, that they can be um, confident that they're introducing really healthy plants that have been vetted. Um, so yeah, that would be my answer. Just probably to, to, to add to that as well, I think having a having an ecosystem and community lens through which to view this and thinking about what what aspects of the complexity of our communities are we missing? What should those can we restore through native wildlife and natural processes as a as a first priority? But thinking thinking more functionally about the complexity of ecosystems and maybe not getting too lost in the in the weeds of whether or not something is one species or another species or 
Um, it is 7.29, which means that uh, it is my duty to close this event. I would like to very, very much uh, thank uh, our speakers. It's been a super interesting event, super cool um, presentation. It's been also uh, super nice to work uh, with the Woodland Trust on this and put this event together. So thank you very much uh, for all the support, for all the cool interaction and the cool discussion. I would also like, uh, there's a number of uh, announcements I need to be doing. Uh, the first one being uh, about uh, a really um, valued member of staff at ZSL that is behind the organization of all those online events, and that's Eleanor uh, Darby. So you don't see her more of, much of in, on those events, but she's the one that uh, kick-started those online events, has done 20 of them uh, for the past four years since she has been working with us. And she's leaving, which is ah, <laughs> killing many people at ZSL. Um, so we're really sad to uh, let her go. Uh, for me, it's particularly funny because I did the first online event with her and I'm doing the last with her too. Uh, so Ellie, know that uh, you're extremely valued. We'll miss you loads. It has been absolutely fantastic to work with you. Um, and we wish you the best of luck uh, with the new position and hope you'll never be a stranger at ZSL. Uh, the second one is to thank everyone that has been tuning in uh, live and uh, that will watch this uh, evening's event. Um, know that we would like to very much uh, hear um, your thoughts and would like uh, to hear what you would like to see in the future, um, uh, how you've been uh, uh, finding these events. So please head to our SurveyMonkey uh, link, which is too complex for me to say, but it's the one on the bottom, surveymonkey.com slash R and then ZSL Mars 23, that's it. Um, and so, or you can uh, use the QR code, uh, which was also quite good, thank you, <laughs> uh, on your phone too. So we have two uh, events coming up, uh, two last events for the 22-23 uh, program. Um, and that will be back in person in our Oxley Lecture Theatre. So the first one is on the 9th of May, uh, where we'll be exploring uh, UK hedgehog conservation, connecting wildlife and people through a flagship species. And the second one on the 6th of June, which is all about uh, lynx recovery uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, and so for both, uh, both are in person and therefore registration is required. There is more information about those events, uh, which will be added shortly to our event page, zsl.org slash science slash events. Oh, it's difficult <laughs> evening. My English is letting me down. Um, and you may have noticed our uh, new websites that have launched and our events page looks a little bit different now. Um, so, but if you're just looking for these events, you can click on filter by and you should be able to select science and conservation events. Um, and finally, if you don't want to miss anything, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and Facebook uh, at these various handles. Uh, also on our website are plenty of other resources like our ZSL Wild Science podcast and information about how to get involved with ZSL by donating, volunteering, or becoming a ZSL fellow. And that's it. <laughs> uh, I've read all my notes. I've done all my duties. So thank you very much again to our speakers tonight for a brilliant, brilliant event. And we look forward to seeing you all um, on the next time. Good night. <laughs>